Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the annual general meeting of Solid State PLC. Uh, we are running a hybrid meeting today, uh, so we have attendees online as well as in the room. Um, throughout the meeting, online attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, questions can be submitted via the Q&A tab in the top right-hand corner of your screen. Um, questions will be addressed ahead of the formal proceedings of the meeting, so please do submit them if you have any now. Uh, we will only be able to address questions relating to public domain information. Um, I would now like to hand you over to Chairman Nigel Rogers. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, welcome everybody, both in the room and those joining us online, um, to the annual general meeting of Solid State PLC. Um, we're here uh, live in the room in Redditch with uh, four shareholders attending in person in addition to the board. So, uh, almost a head count in the room, out outnumbering the board, but not quite, but uh, very good to see you here today. Thank you, and thanks for joining us online. Um, I'll start off with introductions to the board. I think the camera should uh, be broad enough view for everybody to be in view. I'll start with the executive team, um, most of which will be known to you. Um, Graham Marsh, uh, Gary Marsh, I beg your pardon, um, CEO, Pete James, who is CFO, and the two divisional directors, John McMichael and Matthew Richards, who run the components and systems businesses, respectively. Um, the non-executive team, we've seen some changes over the course of the year. Um, I'm going to start off at the left-hand end of the table as I'm sitting with Pete Haining. Pete has been a very valuable member of the company for a number of years. He has some 30 years of history with the company. He's been a director since 1996. Um, I, I have to say he's taken, uh, you know, during that time on the board, the business uh, on, on a journey from being a very small private company to a major international listed business. It's been a, a transformational period of time. And he's been a very steady hand on the, uh, on the tiller during that time. Um, very much uh, you know, providing wisdom, providing perspective and having a very deep historical route in the company and some very good contacts, not only with shareholders, but also with employees outside of the boardroom. So he's been an extremely valuable support to me as I've uh, bedded myself in as chairman and I'd like to um, pay out my respects and thanks to him for that. Um, a major factor in his decision to retire from the board has been increasing pressure by the Corporate Governance Code uh, recognizing that non-executives who exceed their nine-year term are, are sort of uh, under question as whether they are independent or not. Um, I, I can tell you with absolute certainty that Peter's independence in the boardroom has never been um, at question, and I'm sure the executive team would back me up in that. Uh, he's still uh, very happy to ask a difficult question from time to time. So. Um, Peter, I'm delighted to say, is, is going to remain with us as company secretary until the end of the financial year. So we'll continue to have the benefit of that wisdom uh, during a handover period. And we'd like to extend our thanks and our best wishes in your retirement uh, beyond your time Thank with you. us. Thanks. I'd also like to introduce Sam Smith. Um, Sam's joined the board very recently and we're delighted to welcome her on the board. Uh, she has 25 years of experience in capital markets. Um, most of those as leader and chief executive of FinCap. Um, obviously, that experience is invaluable uh, in the company boardroom, although it's fair to say that's not the primary driver in terms of her appointment and the, and the reasons why she stood out amongst the candidates that we spoke to. Mostly, it's her insight as an entrepreneur. Um, she's spent many, many years both building what was initially a small business into a very large one, but also advising growth companies uh, with a particular perspective on growth companies that are led by women. Um, but generally, she has uh, you know, a breadth of experience, particularly in people management, talent management and succession planning. And I think as our business grows over the next few years, that's going to be very valuable insight to us. So welcome on board to Sam. Um, last and only least, Pete McGowan, who most people will have met at previous AGMs. Pete joined the board in 2020 um, and chairs the remuneration committee. So with that said, um, last thing on board structure is that we are likely to appoint an additional independent non-executive director over the course of the next 12 months who will be put up for re-election at the next annual general meeting. Um, before I start the formal uh, business of the meeting, I'm now going to turn to an AGM statement which was published at 7 a.m. this morning. Some people will have read it. For those that haven't, I'll uh, take a sip of water and then read it for you. Might need to be a gulp, it's quite long. 
So our trading update this morning was published at 7 a.m. Solid State PLC, the specialist value added component supplier and design and manufacturer of computing, power and communications products, announces an AGM statement ahead of its annual general meeting being held at Two Ravens Bank Business Park at Aero Road, Redditch at 9.30 today. The directors are pleased to report a strong start to the financial year across both divisions as the group continues to benefit from its robust and diverse customer base across multiple sectors. The geopolitical drivers have meant the group has seen particularly strong order intake in the security and defence sector, with the medical sector continuing to see good demand and new design opportunities. Custom Power, acquired just over a year ago, is now an integral part of the group, providing US battery power production. Solid State has continued to see the benefits of the excellent collaboration between the group's UK and US teams to create product and marketing development opportunities demonstrating the value of the strategy of internationalizing the group and positioning it to take advantage of this high growth sector. The NATO contract referred to in previous announcements has now been substantially delivered with the result that the associated inventory and payables position reported at the final results in July is unwinding. Solid State continues to maintain a strong balance sheet which provides the business with advantageous commercial and competitive strength for working capital needs and M&A opportunities. The group continues to invest in securing inventory to manage the delivery of its order book through timely order fulfillment and supply chain risk mitigation. As previously reported, we expect to see net debt continuing to fall in the first half and to be consistent with the expectations for the full year. The order book profile, driven by customer order schedules, is continuing to normalize as lead times improve. The order book remains strong, totaling 101.1 million with around 65% expected to be delivered in the remainder of the current financial year. The board is confident in meeting the recently upgraded forecasts for the full year and in managing supply chain and input cost risks, which remain stubborn, whilst also being mindful of the current macroeconomic risks. Solid state remains ambitious and continues to review acquisition opportunities and organic growth initiatives with a view to meeting its new 2030 strategic objectives of maintaining compound annual growth in total shareholder return in excess of 20% per annum. A further trading update will be announced towards the end of October in respect of the first six months trading of this financial year. And that's the end of the announcement. There is a footnote to the announcement uh, which refers to uh, consensus market expectations for the current financial year with revenue at 147.3 million, adjusted PBT of 11.9 and net debt of 3.1. I'm now going to turn to the formal part of the meeting. Um, with permission, I'm going to take the notice of meeting as read. I'm sure you don't want me to read that, having had to uh, endure my voice long enough on the trading updates. Um, but first, I'm going to open the meeting up for q and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, strictly speaking, they ought to be aligned with the resolutions that we're voting on, although if there's any questions which fall outside of that scope, we'll answer them where we can, provide that, that the information is generally available in the public domain. So there will also potentially be questions coming in online, but if I may, I'm going to start in the room. Roger. Roger, private investor. <clears throat> Your, your company is uh, very, very um, acquisitive, shall we say. Um, and, and one of the concerns I have as a client in is that, that the acquisition is very well. Um, both in terms of the price that you pay for these companies and also that nothing comes with them that, that is actually a skeleton in the company. Can you talk a bit about um, how you price these acquisitions? Yes. And um, and what do what due diligence should do to make sure that, that, that we don't get um, problems that some other companies have had. Yes. Of course. No, Nigel, Nigel, could you possibly recap the question, please, for online uh, attendees? It wasn't quite as clear as we would have liked. So the, the question was an observation that the company is very acquisitive and is seeking reassurance as to how acquisition opportunities are priced 
and also the degree of due diligence that is carried out in order to uh, ensure that we don't fall into any bear traps which have been observed in other companies. Thank you. I think uh, R Roger has been observing another company in particular that uh, we were talking about earlier, which was uh, name's gone. Forgive me. XP Power. XP Power. Thank you. So, um, in response to the question, Roger, first of all, um, I would just push back slightly on saying we're very, very acquisitive. You know, there, there are companies that are set up to do multiple acquisitions each year. Whereas I think our profile has been much steadier than that. And I think our acquisition pr profile has been very considered and, and with a cadence that enables <laughs> us to digest one deal before we do the next, generally speaking. Um, in, in terms of the pricing mechanism and the work that we do, I'm going to pass your question, I think, first to Gary, who I think is uh, well qualified as, as the lead we, in this area. We look, um, we look for acquisitions to be earnings enhancing, if we can, almost straight away. So that, that's a key key part of that. We're, we're, we're very conscious of, of shareholder dilution. So we've made two fundraisers in the 27 years we've been we've been on aim. We, we look at a lot of companies and turn most of them away. Uh, to be honest, it, the due diligence is, is a very important part of that. Uh, we do a lot of in-house due diligence to start with. When we get into more formal due diligence, that includes our, our lawyers that we work with that team for a number of years, so they, they know us well. They've got a good network around the world for, for others. So we, we use a very good firm in the US for custom power, for example. We also have financial DD. We've also strengthened the team in the other part of this year. Someone joined us from KPMG on M&A activity. So we've got a, a much stronger team there, which is, is helpful as we look to grow, grow the business. Um, so yeah, there, it, it's, it's clear that the acquisitions have to fit with the four tenets of our strategy being internationalization of the group, adding complementary products, uh, potential of our own brand products and, and, and talent development, um, that they're key, key tenets of the strategy. So they have to be aligned to that. If not, uh, we, we, don't, we don't pursue it. Um, regarding size, as the business grows, um, a sort of sweet spot would probably be 15 to 25 million pounds of turnover. It's not saying we won't go smaller businesses if they offer niche areas for us and specialisms, we'll, we'll do that. So um, we, we don't have a rigid rule book on that, but I think the, the key thing is they've got to fit in with the strategy and we, we look for them to be honest in answer. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think there's probably a little bit of a chuckle around the boardroom table at the thought of Gary overpaying for anything. Uh, that is his <laughs> reputation. <laughs> anything further in the room? Notice goodwill has gone up, up, up with the acquisitions, also intellectual property. What, how do you ensure you keep the value? But potentially, worst case scenario, intellectual property walks out the door and doesn't come back. Equally, with a record of change, uh, what was worth a lot 10 years ago, if not five years ago, is very less valuable now because of technical change and also competition, competitive change. Yes. That's my statement. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly as part of the pricing mechanism on acquisition, one of the benchmarks is to look at the net assets of the business, and particularly also intangible net assets of a business and compare those with the price. And, and clearly the higher the asset cover, the lower the risk of, of downside failure. Um, so I, th I think your observation is perfectly valid and one that we take into account. In terms of uh, the, the financial treatment of goodwill uh, and uh, also of intangible assets. I think Pete's more uh, qualified to comment I, I as think, well. Yeah, IFRS has moved us to a position where goodwill is no longer amortized as it used to be. Um, and they, yeah, you, you therefore have to do annual impairment reviews. Um, so future performance is, is absolutely critical to uh, maintaining the carrying value of that goodwill. Um, intangibles, you can and we do amortize over an appropriate life for those intangibles that are identified through the, uh, the acquisition process. Um, and for us, that's typically yeah, three to 10 years, depending on the nature of the intangibles. Thank you. Okay, Tom, I'm going to pass over to you and take any questions from the online audience, if I could, please. We, we don't have any questions here, Nigel, so you can move on to the formal. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. 
Um, so as I've said, I'm going to take the notice of meeting as read. Uh, we do have a number of proxies which have been placed in advance of the meeting. I don't propose to read those in detail, but I can report that uh, approximately 46% of the total shareholder body or 96% of those voting have voted in favour of the ordinary resolutions and the special resolution, a total of 44% of the total shareholder body representing 90% of the uh, those voting have voted in favour in advance of the meeting. So I'm now going to proceed with the resolutions. Um, first resolution one, which is to receive the accounts for the year ended 31st of March 2023, together with the report of the directors and auditors thereon. All those in favour, please. Any against? Thank you. Resolution two, to appoint the director to approve the director's report on the remuneration. This is an advisory vote only. All those in favor, please. Any against? Thank you. Uh, ordinary resolution number three, to declare a final dividend of 13.5 pence per share. All those in favor, please. Any against? Thank you. Resolution four, to reappoint myself as a director of the company. All those in favor, please. Thank you very much. Um, all those, uh, sorry, to reappoint Gary Marsh as director of the company with the correct Christian name on this occasion. <laughs> Thank you. Any against? Thank you. Uh, resolution six to appoint John McMichael as a director of the company. All those in favor? Any against? Thank you. Resolution seven to appoint Peter James as a director of the company. All those in favor? Any against? Thank you. Resolution eight, to reappoint Matthew Richards as the director of the company. All those in favor? Any against? Thank you. Resolution nine, to appoint Peter McGowan as the director of the company. All those in favor? Any against? Thank you. Resolution 10, to reappoint Samantha Smith as the director of the company, with apologies for using her full Christian name. She doesn't really <laughs> use, normally do that. Any against? Thank you. Resolution 11 to reappoint RSM UK Audit LLP as auditors of the company. All those in favour? Any against? Thank you. Ordinary Resolution 12 to authorise the directors to fix the auditors' remuneration. All those in favour? Any against? Thank you. Resolution 13, which I'm not going to read in full, although anybody who would like me to could ask. Thank you. To authorise the directors to allot shares with preemption rights not exceeding 33% of the authorised share capital. All those in favour? Any against? Thank you. Resolution 14, which is a special resolution, to authorise the directors to allot shares without preemption rights of up to 10% of the authorised share capital. All those in favour? Any against? Thank you. And resolution 15, to authorise the company to buy back its own shares under certain conditions. All those in favour? Any against? Thank you very much. With that, I declare the meeting closed. Super. Thank That's you. That's also those online. Yes, thank you, Nigel. Um, could I just mention, if any shareholders are interested in attending a site visit, please do contact us on solidstate at walbrookpr.com. Uh, other than that, many thanks for attending this year's AGM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.